The Clone Wars is one of the most heavily explored areas of Star Wars lore. Over the years, since the release of Attack of the Clones, this three-year period has been the subject of TV series, novels, comic strips, video games, and so much more. We've discussed the bulk of this material on this channel before, analyzing individual stories and discussing how they connect with one another. But something we don't touch on much is how these stories contrast. You see, while all Clone Wars era stories are about the same war, different sources approach the Clone Wars and its subjects from wildly different angles, from the relatively optimistic framing of Star Wars The Clone Wars to the bleaker and darker Star Wars Republic comics. Today, we're going to be taking a close look at a piece of Clone Wars media with a unique and particularly interesting framing, the 2005 first-person shooter Star Wars Republic Commando. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Star Wars The Clone Wars is beloved for many reasons, and one we keep coming back to on this channel time and time again is how it dealt with its clone characters. From very early on, one of The Clone Wars' biggest successes was taking an army composed of identical men and making each one into a unique individual, something the films never accomplished or even attempted. It's sometimes credited as the first piece of Clone Wars era media to treat the clones in such a way, but that's not exactly true. The Expanded Universe had fleshed out clone characters from fairly early on, and Republic Commando in particular revolved around them. Star Wars Republic Commando and the tie-in novel series of the same name did pretty much everything the Clone Wars did with the clones, and it did it a few years earlier. In the game itself, every single major character is a clone, and the only non-clone characters with lines longer than a sentence each are Ton Wei, who only appears in the prologue, and Yoda, who only appears in the epilogue. Even more so than Star Wars The Clone Wars, Republic Commando was a clone-centric story, but the way it approaches this concept is markedly different. There are two major factors in Republic Commando that differentiate its approach to the clones from Star Wars The Clone Wars's. The first is that it makes its protagonist clones different. There are five major clone characters in Republic Commando, those being the four members of Delta Squad and their advisor. The advisor isn't much of a character, he's just a voice in the back of your head relaying orders and providing exposition, a stand-in for Republic military leadership. But the members of Delta Squad are far more fleshed out. Each of them is unique, and not just in their personalities and the paint jobs of their armor, they even have different voices. Someone unfamiliar with Star Wars who played this game could probably get pretty far in without realizing that the members of Delta Squad were clones at all. The other major differentiator is that Republic Commando implies that the clone protagonists are exceptions to the rule and not representative of the Grand Army as a whole. In the prologue, Torn Wei describes the clone commandos as being superior to their more common brethren and even something truly special. This is reflected in gameplay. Regular clones are not only much weaker than the members of Delta Squad, but they're also depicted as often being incompetent and, in one case, even cowardly, and unlike the commando protagonists, they all have the same voice. This falls in line with how other major clone characters were written in the expanded universe at the time, as unique exceptions in what was otherwise an army of one man. With that said, other clones aren't a common sight in Republic Commando. Delta Squad usually works alone behind enemy lines, able to rely on no one but themselves, except for the last few missions when you're allied with the Wookiees. Over the course of the game, the player, who fills the shoes of Delta 38, or Boss, the squad's sergeant, has to learn to rely on the other members of Delta Squad who can be issued commands but otherwise act of their own accord. The player is expected to lay out the general strategies, but for the most part, the other members of Delta Squad are more teammates than subordinates or set pieces. This, combined with their distinctive personalities, gives them a feeling of individuality that other clone characters in the game lack. Delta 62, nicknamed Scorch, isn't just your demolitions man, 
but also the heart of your squad. A laid back, generally cheerful dude who can always be relied on for a quick quip to break the tension. Delta 40, or Fixer, is an expert slicer and, as Ton Wei puts it, a pure and uncomplicated soldier. But he also acts as your right hand man, remaining serious and focused on the objective. Even Fixer though, has personality, clearly caring deeply about the other members of the squad. Delta 07 or Sev is perhaps the most colourful member of the squad, a deep voiced sniper whose personality quite closely resembles HK-47s. He enjoys killing just a bit too much, and he's always got a dark joke or sarcastic remark ready to go. Seven Scorch banter quite regularly, further reinforcing the group's sibling dynamic. All of this further emphasizes that framing we were just talking about. It makes the men of Delta Squad feel special, especially in contrast to all the other clones. We'll be coming back to that later. For now though, let's pivot back to the topic we started with, which was how Republic Commando compares to other depictions of the Clone Wars. Perhaps the most well-known take on the Clone Wars is the one seen in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Though The Clone Wars is widely known as being particularly dark for a Star Wars show in its later seasons, it's actually one of the least gritty depictions of the conflict. As you surely know, The Clone Wars is an anthology about how the Clone Wars shaped those involved with it. The main character of the show is the war itself, in a sense, and all of its actual characters are defined primarily through how the conflict affects them. But while the Clone Wars drags its characters through some real rough stuff, it's ultimately a fundamentally optimistic series. Many of its protagonists manage to find hope in hopeless times and choose free will over submission to authority. It adds silver linings to the Clone Wars that didn't exist before, and its story is ultimately about pushing through the horrors of war to develop as a person instead of sinking into despair and, whether literally or figuratively, giving in to the dark side. Star Wars Republic and a bunch of its companion comics actually have a similar concept, but their approach to the war is much different. Republic is also an anthology about how the Clone Wars shaped those involved with it, but it takes on a much darker tone than the Clone Wars. Whereas some of the Clone Wars' protagonists managed to develop in defiance of the horrors of the Clone Wars, in Star Wars Republic, the Clone Wars are exclusively a corrupting force. In particular, Republic spends a lot of time on how the Clone Wars debase the Jedi, even going so far as to have many of its Jedi protagonists start using blasters instead of lightsabers. It might seem like a minor detail, but it's how the series symbolizes its core message, that the Clone Wars have changed the Jedi into something else, something far less noble than they once were, both on an individual and conceptual level. Star Wars Republic is one of the darkest takes on the Clone Wars, and it's much more pessimistic than Star Wars The Clone Wars. Out of the Republic's many protagonists, the only ones who get a decent ending are Quinlan Vos and his found family, minus Ayla Secura of course. Even then, they achieve this only by refusing to fight any longer, by turning away from the war, from the new empire, and going into hiding. What's more, not even they were supposed to get a pleasant ending originally. Quinlan Vos's final arc only existed because George Lucas specifically requested the series writers give him a happy ending. The original Star Wars Clone Wars micro series takes a bit of a middle road between these two extremes in its depiction of the Clone Wars. Though unlike Republic and the Clone Wars, the micro series isn't really about the war itself. The core of its plot is about Anakin Skywalker and how he develops in the gap between the final two prequels, and most of the other plots are either build up of Revenge of the Sith or set building. This leaves the micro series depiction of the Clone Wars with an inconclusive, somewhat ambiguous tone. Many other pieces of Clone Wars era media take a similar approach. Then there's Republic Commando. Like the micro series, Republic Commando is about a specific set of characters, the men of Delta Squad, not the war itself, but it does have a heavy focus on developing the concept of the Clone Wars all the same. Its depiction is superficially similar to Star Wars Republic's with a very dark tone 
and a distinctly pessimistic outlook. It even makes similar commentary on the Jedi, despite the fact that the Jedi are barely present in the game, summing up Republic's message about Jedi using blasters quite bluntly. An elegant weapon for a more civilized time, huh? Well, guess what? Times have changed. A more elegant weapon for a more civilized time, eh? Well, guess what? Times have changed. However, Republic Commando's depiction of the Clone Wars is unique, in large part because of its perspective. While Star Wars Republic and most other Clone Wars era stories are focused on the Jedi telling the story of the war from above, Republic Commando is exclusively from a clone perspective and it tells the story of the war from below. It's unique among Clone Wars stories in that it barely involves the Jedi at all. All there is is that one lightsaber easter egg we just showed off and the appearance of Yoda at the very end of the game. In this respect, Republic Commando is somewhat like Andor as it focuses on the stories and perspectives of ordinary or at least less extraordinary people. It takes the player into the world of non-Jedi foot soldiers and while the men of Delta Squad are hardly ordinary grunts, it's still a much less fantastical view of the universe and of the Clone Wars. And that view isn't pleasant. Republic Commando depicts the Clone Wars as hell. Every environment is in some way alien and hostile, from the bug-filled tunnels of Geonosis to the intensely creepy ghost ship to the Shadowlands of Kashyyyk. The game does a great job of putting the player constantly on edge. Nowhere feels safe and you can only rely on yourself and your squad mates. Once you complete a mission, you proceed right to the next one. The player can get a bit of a break for as long as they linger on the menu screens, but the characters never do, not even at the end of the game. Republic Commando's nature as a video game allows it to drill this in even more, immersing the player in its depiction of the Clone Wars. The player not only plays as Delta 38, but the game goes out of the way to make them see the world through his eyes. Primarily, it does this through a heavy dose of artistic license. In Star Wars media, and in most forms of visual media, there's an implied distinction between what you see and what is supposed to be taking place in the story. When, for example, Kiadi Mundi's lightsaber changes color between shots in Attack of the Clones, this is understood as a VFX error instead of a thing that's supposed to happen in the story. This is important because it allows for artistic license. It means that media can deliberately deviate from canonical reality for artistic purposes without these deviations becoming canonical inconsistencies. Most of the time, this is a relatively moot point because most forms of Star Wars media try to convey the intended story as directly and as canonically accurately as possible. When artistic license is taken, it's usually just visual stylization. For example, take Star Wars The Clone Wars' animation style and how it exaggerates certain characters' facial features in weird ways. We're not meant to see that as Count Dooku's head getting tall after the attack of the clones and then going back to normal in time for Revenge of the Sith. We understand implicitly that the show is taking artistic license and that there's a distinction between what canonically happened and what's depicted on screen. Artistic license isn't limited to style though, and you can do some pretty cool things with it. Republic Commando does this extensively and in a way that no other piece of Star Wars media really does. It distorts things on purpose, and the way it does so is actually a part of the storytelling of the game. For example, let's consider one of Republic Commando's most feared enemies, the Super Battle Droids. In most Star Wars media, super battle droids are barely better than ordinary battle droids, just with a little more armor and a little less personality. In Star Wars The Clone Wars, clone troopers cut down B2s with ease. But in Republic Commando, super battle droids are these huge imposing bullet sponges that will devour all your ammo and then blast your whole squad back to Kamino. They're terrifying and even more of a threat than droidikas. So what's the deal? Are the super battle droids in Republic Commando just built different? To a degree, yes. Some of the features the droids have in Republic Commando are canonically variant modifications. But at least in part, their increased difficulty is a form of artistic license. 
The game isn't telling you that Super Battle Droids were canonically capable of withstanding approximately 300 DC-17M rounds, other Clone Wars sources show otherwise. The B2s work the way they do to elicit fear from the player, to make the player see these well-armed, imposing droids the same way a clone would. This doesn't just apply to enemies either. The Wookiees are also depicted much differently in Republic Commando than in any other source. They're twice the height of the player character and ridiculously burly, resembling the Brutes from Halo more than Chewbacca. This is another and even more obvious case of artistic license. The Wookiees seem enormous to clones who've never met one before, and so the game exaggerates their proportions to give the player the same sense of awe and relative tininess. The Wookiees, as seen in the films, are more familiar to the player than they are to the clones, so Republic Commando makes the Wookiees distinctly unfamiliar, allowing the player to more easily slip into the role of Delta 38. Republic Commando is packed full of this sort of artistic license. The Geonosians and Trandoshans are made much more alien, given subspecies with additional limbs and radically different heights respectively, while the droid control ship and RAS prosecutor are scaled up, dramatically so in the latter case, to make them seem more imposing and, in the case of the prosecutor, empty. Even the basic B1 battle droids have unique paint jobs and behave like proper soldiers, making them seem mildly more threatening than they do in the show or the films. At every turn, Republic Commando uses artistic license to immerse the player in its world, putting them in the boots of a clone commando fighting on some of the worst battlefronts of the Clone Wars. But Republic Commando's artistic license isn't just limited to appearances. The different voices of the members of Delta Squad are artistic license as well. Canonically, the Deltas wouldn't have had different voices. They were clones after all. Instead, the game gives them all different voices to further accentuate their individuality. The Delta's voices not only reflect their personalities, but they're meant to allow the player to infer more about their squad mates' personalities. It's a neat little trick meant to allow the player to perceive the members of Delta Squad as they would have perceived themselves, or at least as Boss perceived them, and unlike other ways of achieving this aim, this little bit of artistic license guides the player to make the inferences and connection the game wants them to completely subconsciously. All the other clones sound the same, if different from the members of Delta Squad, because the player character isn't meant to have that same familiarity with them. In this way, Republic Commando builds an incredibly detailed image of the Clone Wars that the player is allowed to simply experience. The thing is, Republic Commando doesn't just do this for immersion. In a sense, the game is lying to you. It's using artistic license to get you to see things a certain way, and this has a narrative purpose beyond immersion. The artistic license taken with depicting the members of Delta Squad, particularly through their voices, is designed to get the player to see the commandos as Delta 38 would, and part of this, the game leads the player into buying some of Boss's own misconceptions. Just as the Deltas would have all had the same voice canonically, Republic Commando carries the implication that, on the whole, the Commandos weren't as individual as the player was led to believe. But we'll come back to that in a bit. First, we need to discuss the game's story. Republic Commando isn't terribly story-driven. Most of its plot is just flavoring, involving little more than a series of missions Delta Squad is assigned to carry out. The first batch of missions is set during the Battle of Genosis and involves Delta Squad doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work, crippling parts of the Separatists' defenses and finishing jobs that other Commando teams failed to complete. The next batch of missions comes a year later and covers Delta Squad's investigation of a ghost ship, the RAS Prosecutor, a Republic warship that, as you learn, was stolen by Trandoshan privateers. The last chapter is set on Kashyyyk during the Outer Rim Sieges, and it sees the men of Delta Squad play a major role in the early stages of that climactic battle. For the most part, the missions themselves don't tell too much of a story. The game is more focused on how your squad develops as they complete them. In the Geonosis chapters, you and your squad mates learn to work together, overcoming challenges that other commando teams failed to complete. 
Your performance on Geonosis gives Delta Squad a reputation as one of the Republic's foremost commando teams, further emphasizing the uniqueness of you and your squad mates. On the Prosecutor, your squad is separated and you have to meet up again before proving your worth by battling a whole droid army. By the time you reach Kashyyyk, your squad has become the best of the best. The only squad the Republic has that's capable of aiding the Wookiees against Trandoshan slavers and defending Kashyyyk against the first wave of General Grievous' armies. Through it all, Delta Squad only gets stronger and more tightly knit. As Delta 38, you come to rely on your clone brothers and the player buys into Boss's view of his squad more. The legend of Delta Squad grows as you play through the game too. You go from being a particularly skilled squad of clones to blowing up separatist capital ships, turning the tide of entire battles and facing whole armies without losing a single man. United, your squad is invincible and apart from getting split up on the Prosecutor, you remain united until the last mission when you need to split up once more to blow up a separatist destroyer. Throughout the game, there are also vague allusions to your mission's impact and context within the broader Clone Wars. These aren't too substantial, but they're sufficient to give the player the feeling that their actions have some sort of broader purpose. Even then though, this only begins on the Prosecutor. The player, much like the clones themselves, is never given any reason for the assault on Genosis. But starting with the Prosecutor, a bit of context begins to trickle in. Your missions go from being about fighting a war with the Separatists to helping the Wookiees against Trandoshan slavers allied with the Separatists. This ramps up significantly during the Kashyyyk missions when you start working with Wookiee resistance fighters, battling the slavers and fighting to liberate the city of Kachiro from Separatist occupation. Slowly, Republic Commando gets you to think of yourself as a hero. On Kashyyyk, your missions are framed with familiar concepts from the original trilogy. You're assisting an underdog rebel faction battling oppressive occupiers. It takes your missions and the relationships you formed with your squad and injects meaning into them. And then, the very end of the game rips all of that away. Republic Commando ends with two punches to the gut. The first one is quite infamous. The last mission of the game involves Delta Squad splitting up to destroy a Commerce Guild destroyer in the process driving the remaining Trandoshan and CIS forces from Kachiro. You're successful and the warship is destroyed to triumphant fanfare, but this victory is quickly made hollow when you lose contact with Sev, whose last transmission suggests that he's been cornered by overwhelming Separatist forces. And you're not allowed to rescue him or even try to help. The advisor orders you and the rest of your squad to withdraw from Kachiro immediately and you're given no choice but to obey. It's pretty common knowledge these days that Republic Commando ends with Sev being left for dead. You're given no closure of any sort in the matter. It's left unclear whether he's still alive and you're not allowed to investigate. To twist the knife even further, the surviving members of Delta Squad aren't even allowed time to grieve. They're thrust right into the next mission even as the game's credits roll. Sev's loss is world shattering for the commandos of Delta Squad, but for the broader Republic military machine, it's just another casualty, quickly forgotten. The advisor, despite having been your eye in the sky for three years, shows no signs of caring, even going so far as to say that the loss of one commando is less important than the Republic's operations on Kashyyyk. The loss of Sev is such a blow that many players don't even notice the second gut punch that Republic Commando delivers at the end of the game. It's complete recontextualization of the player's actions. As Delta Squad returns to the Republic fleet, the advisor explains that your mission on Kashyyyk was actually to act as an advance force for a full-scale Republic invasion of the planet. And before your very eyes, a massive assault fleet descends on Kashyyyk and the invasion begins. In Revenge of the Sith, this operation is framed positively. From the Jedi Council's perspective, it's aimed at thwarting the droid attack on the Wookiees at liberating Kashyyyk. But if the advisor's use of the word invasion doesn't clue you in to what's really going on here, the music used during the final cutscene should.
This blow is softened a little by a quick appearance from Yoda, at which point the music quickly changes, but the message of this moment is clear. The Republic is just another invader, and this invasion is the beginning of the Imperial occupation of Kashyyyk. The Republic is allied with the Wookiees for now, but it won't be very long before it turns around and enslaves them. And the player is responsible for all of it. All of their efforts on Kashyyyk were, unbeknownst to them, the opening stages of this occupation. Even as they deceived the Wookiees into thinking the Republic was there to help, the men of Delta Squad themselves were being deceived. This final twist means that the player was never a hero. Rather, they and their squad mates were just pawns of the Ascendant Empire, and the little bits of context the game gives your actions were only part of the story. As fans of the expanded universe know, just a few years after the Delta Squad helped drive the Trandoshan slavers off Kashyyyk, the Empire would bring them back, this time as partners in their occupation. Just as the Wookiees were merely allies of convenience for the Republic, the Republic opposed the Trandoshans not because they were slavers, but solely for strategic reasons. This is something Star Wars Republic touches on in its final issues as well, and in both cases, it recontextualizes the nature of the Clone Wars as a whole. Both Republic Commando and Star Wars Republic have a sharply negative image of the war, but for most of their respective stories, both allow the audience to see the conflict as a necessary evil to some extent, even if they make the evil of the Clone Wars undeniable. But the endings of both stories strip that away. There was nothing necessary about the Clone Wars, and by fighting at all, those on the side of the Republic just ended up making things worse. In Star Wars Republic, only a few characters are able to escape this, and the only way they were able to do so was to abandon the war and save their strength for the forthcoming rebellion against the Empire. But in Republic Commando, Delta Squad is given no such choice. At the end of Republic Commando, Delta Squad's orders are clear. They have to get back to the fight, even if it means leaving Sev behind. They have no choice in the matter. As clones, they're the fully owned slaves of the Republic, created for the express purpose of fighting and dying in the Clone Wars. They could try to rebel against these orders, but they don't. In the end, they leave Sev to his fates and resign themselves to continuing the fight. Even Scorch, who's openly distraught after Sev's loss and initially urges Boss to defy orders and go after Sev, falls in line by the end. This has implications for how Republic Commando deals with clone identity, which we alluded to earlier. Like many other Clone Wars era stories, it portrays some of its clone characters as individuals, and it goes farther in this respect with the members of Delta Squad than pretty much any other Clone Wars story. Sure, it dismisses the other clones for the most part, treating them as little more than living droids, but it constantly reinforces that the men of Delta Squad are a unique case. As Tornway said, something truly special. Except the end of the game reveals this as a lie. In sharp contrast to Star Wars The Clone Wars, which uses its unique clone protagonists to build up the idea that all clones were unique individuals, the ending of Republic Commando actually undermines the individuality of the clones. Delta Squad, it's revealed, was never special after all. No matter how different from each other and their fellow clones the commandos you fight alongside may seem, at the end of the day, they're all still clones, the slaves of the Republic, and in the end, they have no choice but to fall in line, just like all the others. It's deeply pessimistic, more so than any other Clone Wars story. In a sense, this message can be seen as a sort of preemptive reply to Star Wars The Clone Wars. While The Clone Wars focuses on the message that the clones are individuals with their own personalities, Republic Commando says that that doesn't matter. No matter how different clones' personalities are, their role in The Clone Wars strips them of all individuality. They're clones, products, seen by their superiors as resources instead of people, and to an extent they would be, even if they were ordinary humans recruited into the GAR instead of being purpose-bred by the Kaminoans. The commandos of Delta Squad, just like all the other soldiers fighting for the Republic in the Clone Wars, were just tools of the Empire. This strips them of their individuality and even their humanity. To make matters worse, 
they see no other choice but to continue to be this way. Instead of rebelling at the end of the game, when their disposability and the moral bankruptcy of the Republic are put on full display, Delta Squad chooses to get back in line. They accept their role as disposable clones, and because of this, what little individuality it might seem they have becomes meaningless. It's possible that if Republic Commando ever got a sequel, this would have changed. Perhaps a Republic Commando 2 could have seen the survivors of Delta Squad rebel against the Empire and take back some sense of agency. But because such a sequel was never made, Republic Commando leaves us with nothing but pessimism with no hope of a more pleasant resolution. The song that plays during the game's end credits, Clones by the band Ash, makes this message a bit more explicit. Because this is YouTube, we obviously can't play a snippet of the song here as much as we'd like to, so we'll instead subject you to a reading of the song's chorus. Shame, when everyone's the same. I thought you stood alone, were different from the clones. I thought you were the true exception to the rule, but the truth is cruel. What Torn Way says to the player at the start of Republic Commando is a lie. The commandos of Delta Squad weren't unique or special or an exception of any sort. They were just another batch of clones, the slaves of the Republic, stripped of their very personhood by the Clone Wars. That's what makes Republic Commando's take on the Clone Wars so unique. Not only does it force the player to see and feel the horror of the war, but it also makes the conflict darker and more pessimistic than even Star Wars Republic. Republic frames the war as a corrupting force that not even the Jedi are immune to, but Republic Commando goes even further. In doing so, it brings Star Wars back to its anti-war, anti-empire roots. As much as it might not seem terribly deep or story-driven, Republic Commando makes an important and sobering contribution to the themes of the Star Wars universe. Well, that's a depressing note to end on, but there's still the message of Star Wars The Clone Wars to consider. Even for clones, there's still a way out, and that way is rebellion. We hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into Republic Commando, and now we'd like to hear what you think. Have you thought about any of this before? Do you think we missed anything important? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.